In the Arctic Circle, in the north of Russia, there are roads which only exist for a few weeks each year. Conditions in the ice are extreme. If you take the winter road, you do so at your own peril. In Siberia, many roads are made not of tarmac, but of ice and snow. The winter road linking Salihat and Nadim is only passable from December to April. When spring arrives on the border between Taiga and Tundra, temperatures rise from minus 50 to minus 20 degrees Celsius. It's the beginning of the end for the road of ice. Yuri Zirbu knows this road like no other. He's accompanying a heavy haulage back to Salikhat, his hometown. In spring, water flows across the frozen ground, turning the road into an icy piste. The two drivers need to cross a dangerous section. The top is dangerous. We could slide down. Let's stay at the bottom. Keep to the bottom. Drive slowly in first gear. Is this part dangerous? No, you just have to be careful. Stay on this track over there and just keep going, on and on. Many people try to take the upper part of the road and slide down. Sometimes they even overturn and fall to the side. It's a really tricky part. You have to be very precise when driving. Leonid Padalka specializes in heavy haulage driving. He has to maneuver the heavily laden lorry across the ice. almost makes it up the little rise, but the last bit of the slope is too steep and too slippery. It's for moments like this that Yuri Zirbu is with him. We need to make the rope longer, because I'm on a slope, and so is he. I need to get further up the hill. The articulated lorry only makes it across the hill with the help of the second vehicle as long as the makeshift extension of the tow rope holds. We need to get the wheels off the ice, and then you try going in second gear. The drive from Salehad to Nadim and back takes five days, if the weather complies. It's only during the winter months that the men can transport urgently needed goods between the towns. Right now, they need a street roller in Salehad. The drivers reach the city in the evening. Founded as a Cossack fortress, Salehad today lives off the vast gas fields of this region. The gas reserves are among the biggest in the world and have made the town an affluent community. Despite the extreme temperatures, some 40,000 people live here. On the outskirts of the town, the company premises of Yamalov Todor, the region's road-building contractor, can be found. Yamalov Todor is responsible for building and maintaining the region's few roads. The 
company employs Leonid Padalka and Yuri Zidbu as drivers. They are glad it has got a little colder. At minus 30 degrees, their work becomes easier. Before the temperatures rise again and the road sinks into the mud, they have to drive one last heavy haulage across. They urgently need an asphalt paver at the other end of the winter road in Nadim. Before they can set off, the 15-ton machine needs to be loaded onto the trailer. If the track widths are not the same, the machine can topple over. It's so heavy, it's impossible to load it back up. In order to make sure the load doesn't slide off en route, the men painstakingly secured it on the trailer. Good preparation is the very least they can do to get across the ice road. Yuri Zirbu loves the north, but he also knows its dangers. You can freeze to death very quickly. You won't even feel it. You look for an escape. You clasp at every straw to get out and reach your destination to solve your problem. But you're very much afraid. The convoy will be travelling on this road without any contact with the outside world for several days. There is no mobile phone reception. If you want to take the winter road, you have to know about the dangers. Everyone registers at the entrance. The convoy consists of four vehicles. The lorry with its heavy load is followed by a bulldozer, which is supposed to clear the way in case of an emergency. Then there's a lorry with building materials. At the back is Yuri Zirbu, securing the convoy. Sarikhat is situated in the autonomous yamalo nenets region, right on the Ob River in the Arctic Circle. The winter road to Nadim is some 300 kilometers long and leads through marshland and across several rivers. It's the only road which connects Salihat with the outside world. At the other end of the road in Nadim, Konya Prokhorov and Yegor Stefanenka want to risk the drive across the winter road. The two share an unusual passion. They love driving cross-country, away from regular roads. For the summer, they are planning an off-road trip across Russia. They want to use the winter road to test themselves and their cars in the most extreme conditions. They told us not to let any more lorries pass. We'll wait until tonight. The boss wanted to call back then. He said that maybe we won't let any more lorries pass from now on. How's the road? Is it slippery? <coughs> yes. Will we get through with the jeep? Yes, you will. Why won't you let any more lorries pass? It's warm, it's thawing. How long for? Until 6 p.m. All right, thanks. The two off-road drivers are from Nadim and have never made it all the way to the neighboring town of Salihat. Now, at the end of the winter, they have picked the most unpleasant time for their trip. There is neither accommodation nor any restaurants along these 300 kilometers. They have to look after themselves. It started to thaw, the snow's getting heavier. We'll hope for the best. I heard the weather forecast. They forecast temperatures above zero. Best thing would be to drive at night. It'll probably be colder then. During the day, it'll be pretty wet. We've thought it through. We're well prepared. We double-check everything several times before we embark on a tour like this. It's the only way. We value our life and our health very much.
the road leads across a river. In just a few weeks' time, barges will be travelling here instead of cars. But for now, the ice holds. Weather-beaten pylons and deformed rail tracks remind us of Stalin's superpower fantasies which were thwarted by the eternal cold of northern Siberia. After World War II, the dictator wanted to build a railway line along the Arctic Circle. The secret project was called Stalin's Railway, or the Route of Death. More than 100,000 Gulag prisoners were exposed to the cold with no protection. Extreme driver Yegor Stefanenka sees the camps for the first time. Stalin's railway was never in operation. Two weeks after Stalin's death, work stopped. At the other end of the winter road, Yuri Zubu has veered off the right path. Even experienced drivers have a hard time recognizing where the road ends and deep snow begins. In the course of the day, it becomes warmer again. There is no traction between snow and wheels. The snow is like soap, the wheels just spin. Because of the angle, it would take him hours to get out of this situation by himself. The edge of hard-pressed snow makes it hard to get the wheels back on solid ground. You need to understand that the temperatures of the air, the ground and the snow are all different and that it's all interconnected. Only then you can come to a conclusion and make a decision on which way to take best. Right now, he needs less air in his tyres. Yuri's path takes him back into deep snow. He wants to make the road wider. With his Russian Ural truck, which is specially designed for heavy territory, he can change the air pressure in the tires while he's driving. With less air, the tires are like the paws of a bear. When a bear steps on branches, you'd think they break, but they don't. They don't even make a sound. This also applies to the tires of the Ural. Now the vehicle has created the necessary space for itself and feels like a fish in water. You just need to keep calm and be patient. Don't get hectic. Every year in November, Yuri forges the road into the deep snow, centimeter by centimeter, day by day, until he has made a fresh track across the 300 kilometers from Salihat to Nadim. Ivan and Grigori Ataman are on their way home. They were selling reindeer meat on the market in Salihat and bought some groceries. The two brothers are tundra nomads and members of the Nenets people. Ivan and Grigori live in a small settlement some 130 kilometers outside of Salihat, right in the middle of the tundra. They need a snowmobile or a sledge to get to their tents. Snowmobiles are fast but tiring. After 40 kilometers, the nomads stop for a tea break. This is not just so they can recover. The Nanyets stop in sacred places. To Grigori Ataman and his people, a road is not just a road. 
We always stop over there and make an offering. Sometimes we also throw coins in passing too. You mustn't destroy any branches around here. There are no petrol stations in the tundra. Therefore, the Nenyets brothers always take a barrel of petrol with them. They want to reach their little settlement before nightfall. The last 30 kilometers will lead them through deep snow. Without this road, it took us much longer to get to the town sometimes as long as two or three days. Back in those days, when there was no road, our sledges would get stuck in hilly territory. Today it's the road of life for us. Yuri Zirbu and his convoy colleagues make sure the road will remain passable. On each trip, they chain pipes, which have been welded together, to their lorries. These makeshift four-ton rollers level and compact the snow, which would otherwise break up, blow away, and become impassable within a few days. To make a good road, you need to build it above the tundra. We want the winter road to be similar to a normal road. Normal roads have a firm base. Here we have a base of snow. We keep driving across new snow, so it increases in height. Once the road is above the level of the tundra, you needn't worry about blizzards and wind anymore. The best time for driving on a winter road is at night time. With their headlights, the drivers can make out bumps sooner than in the diffuse daylight. The convoy is making good progress. But then Yuri and his colleagues encounter a lorry which has had an accident. The driver has been stuck since lunchtime. No one has been able to help him. His attempts to free himself have only dug him deeper into the snow. I miscalculated and veered off the road. There was a blizzard and I couldn't see anything. Then I overturned and slid off the road. Yuri wants to pull the lorry out with a rope. The wheel loader also pushes it from behind. The lorry is not moving at all. Try to start the engine. It's complicated. If we could start it, the power of the engine would help us. Right now, it's like a dead weight. Without the engine running, it's practically immovable. Due to the cold temperatures, the vehicles are never switched off on the winter road, not even on longer brakes. The drivers know once the engine cools off, there is nothing they can do without outside help. Everyone out of the way. rescue mission has delayed the convoy considerably. On the winter road, punctuality is a luxury. 
Nowadays it's each to their own. The North doesn't forgive these mistakes. On your own you won't get far in the tundra in this kind of frost. I don't know how strong a man has to be here to get by without help. Sooner or later, everyone needs the help of a friend or a colleague. Ten kilometers further on, there's another accident. Yuri is not surprised. The black eyes here has been the downfall of many a driver. This lorry has been stuck for three days now. Several attempts to help him have failed. The heavy load has pulled the lorry deeper and deeper down the slope. Valera, Try second gear. Yuri quickly realizes that they can't help him either, but the lorry blocks their way. He needs to stay where he is, damn it. We'll carefully go past him so we won't squash him if we slide. We've cleared it all. We give up, uncouple. The convoy carefully drives past the unfortunate vehicle. After a few meters, the wheel loader starts to slide. I told him, you need to drive at the bottom, at the very bottom, so you won't slide. And he replies, very well, only to proceed to drive a different route. The convoy has been on the road for 14 hours. Despite their exhaustion, the drivers make use of the favorable nighttime conditions. They continue to find their way through the cold and snow until dawn. Very few creatures can survive the hostile environment of the Arctic Circle. Extreme differences in temperature, blizzards, permafrost soil. The Nenets people have come to terms with the adversities of nature. The brothers Ivan and Grigori Ataman reached their little settlement of three tents on the previous evening. Together, they take a breakfast of tea and raw, frozen reindeer meat. Some 40,000 Nenets live in the region of Yamalo Nenets, named after them. In their language, Nense means man. Some of them have preserved the old culture. They live as nomads of the tundra. With their tents, they move from place to place. The Nenets practice strict division of labor. The women are responsible for the tent, the food and the children. The men take care of the reindeer and the hunting. Reindeer are the Nenets' treasure. Many nomad families have thousands of the animals at their disposal. Tents and clothing are made from reindeer hides. Nothing else keeps you as warm. The dogs are restless. They can feel that they will be hunting today. Spring is coming, and soon Grigory, Ivan and their friend will start heading for the summer meadows up north with their herds. This means the herd, which has been living independently of its owners, needs to be rounded up again. Grigori is the owner of 3,000 reindeer. They are able to withstand colder temperatures than any other farm animal. First, the men want to catch some individual animals. The animals can smell trouble. Hello, 
With their snowmobiles, Grigori and his brother round up the animals and herd them towards the others, who are waiting with their lassoes. They try to catch the male lead animals. Reindeer hooves are very broad and they can move fast in deep snow. As soon as they've caught the first reindeer, they tether them to the wooden sleighs. They need to get used to their task as working animals again. The rest of the herd follows them voluntarily. Soon it will be impossible to drive around on the snowmobiles. Then we won't be able to go into town. Once it thaws, everything gets waterlogged. The road becomes impassable. Now we take those reindeer to the herd. Then we catch the younger ones and train them up too. The first sleigh is ready to go. Soon the Nenets will ride hundreds of kilometers up north on them, always following the cold into the vast tundra. The drivers use the roof of Yuri's Ural as a refrigerator. The convoy has driven until the morning. Before they can carry on, they need to put a good meal on the table. The delicacy of the north is called muksum, a fish whose home is the Ob River. Yuri cuts up the raw fish, as Nenyet's tradition dictates, into small strips. It's freshly frozen. The fish is for internal use, with salt and pepper. Vodka is desirable too. Without vodka, it's not perfect, but you can eat it anyway. The night was cold. The wheel valves are frozen. We let the air out of the tyres so the car can cope better with the winter road, so it won't get damaged. If there's less air in the tyres, it's easier to drive, and you've got a better grip between the snow and wheels. Halfway between Nadim and Salehat, there is a station. Yuri and the others want to reach this station today. Many drivers make use of the last days when the road is still passable. Soon, it will be closed. For the next eight months, transports will have to take place by plane or ship. The road disappears, as it were. The only reminders are the wrecks of the unlucky lorries. An oncoming driver tells Yuri about conditions on the rest of the way. They say the road to Nadim is bad. Will our convoy make it? It will probably get through, though. If not, use the ropes. You can get through on the tracks. Have you been getting through OK? Yeah. The road is like soap. It's turned warm. I'll string up and carry on now. Have a good trip. In the north of Siberia, the permafrost soil is hundreds of meters deep. On top, there are vast swamplands which the winter road leads through. Parts of them thaw when temperatures reach 15 degrees below zero. In some areas, even experienced drivers like Yuri find it hard to make out whether the road is still passable at all. It's still OK at the moment. Sometimes the water comes up to my feet in the cabin. In some places, the water is up to one and a half meters deep. 
The difficult bit is that you don't know what's underneath. In the spring, there's water coming from above and from below, so the ice is no longer solid, but it breaks. It can cave in any time, really, any time. The convoy has reached the little station halfway between Salakat and Nadim. Many people take a brief break there before they tackle the second part of their trip. A reserve fund of petrol helps those drivers who underestimated the high petrol consumption on the winter road. Yuri's Ural uses more than 50 litres per 100 kilometres. Vasily Volkov guards the station and the petrol. He's a hermit of the winter road. For eight months each year, he's completely alone. For the other four months, when the winter road is in use, his hut is a popular meeting place for truckers. One of the drivers tells of his accident just short of the station. This morning, his lorry overturned. He was carrying a load of petrol. Fellow drivers freed him from the broken vehicle and brought him here. My first thought was, damn, this is it. I thought I was dead. But this was the end. Then I wondered, is this what heaven looks like? Everything was upside down. You see nothing. There's snow everywhere. Are you still alive or not? You just don't know. No one knows. In the old days, they forced us to drive. Now we do it of our own free will. Yes, now we do it of our own free will. Temperatures rise to five degrees below zero. Blizzards are increasingly likely. The wind picks up. Within a few hours, the road is covered in loose snow. The road markings on either side disappear. Off-road drivers Kolya and Yegor find it more and more difficult to drive their cars across the blown away road. The front axle of Collier's vehicle has hit deep snow. He won't be able to get out again by himself. Yegor has to help him. The wind has become very strong. It blows snow onto the road, so we can expect more snow drifts. We'll have to keep pulling the other one out a few more times. The jolt at the start pulls off part of the rope holder, but at least Collier's car has come unstuck. I drove quite a deep track into here. It's only 30 metres to the other side of the snowbank. They could make it if they drive faster. The men start wondering if they will make it back home this winter. If they have to leave their vehicles behind, they'll never see them again. The convoy drivers also find it hard to keep control over what's going on. The snow is wet and slippery. The lorry carrying the asphalt machine won't make it up the hills on its own. When attempting to tow it, the wheel loader also starts to slide. Once they've dug it out, they start a second attempt at getting the articulated lorry across the hill. They need to cross several hills in a row. Again, the wheels start spinning after a few minutes. 35 tons rotating on the spot. We need more speed. If we go faster, we can pull the lorry up the hill. The rope needs to remain at full stretch. 
If it stops at the bottom of the hill, you can't pull it up. It's stuck. You can only do it together. I'll use fourth gear. It'll be faster that way. If I go in second gear, I'll get stuck. You're simply too slow. There are several hundred weights of bottom ash in the lorry. It's a survival aid for winter road drivers. Bucket by bucket, the drivers put down a trail in the snow so that the wheels can grip at the next attempt. The team carefully rolls back to the bottom of the hill. Then, both drivers will go at full speed simultaneously. Again, the lorry grinds to a halt. But right at that moment, the bulldozer's wheels catch hold in the snow. In the Nanyet settlement, the problems on the winter road go unnoticed. The tundra nomads have been living in the Arctic for thousands of years. Like every year, they quietly prepare for spring. Some of the sleighs need mending. Once every two weeks, Ivan and Grigori slaughter a reindeer for their own use. They need all hands on deck for that. They have to be quick, or the meat will freeze under the knife and the men won't be able to skin the animal. Reindeer meat, reindeer blood and fat are basic foodstuffs as well as a source of income. Ivan and Grigori take the snowmobiles into town for the last time this year. There, they sell reindeer meat and frozen fish. They use the proceeds to buy supplies for the coming months. There's another one who got stuck. The poor guy slid. Shall we try it from the top? Off-roaders Kolya and Yegor are standing in front of a slope which is completely frozen over. Some lorries have slid off and blocked the way. May I offer you my hand, sir? <laughs> this hill is particularly treacherous if you leave the track. Do you want to drive along here? Yes. In the last days, when the winter road is still open, no vehicle makes it through without problems. The icy piste becomes a slide for man and machine. Kolya and Yegor don't want to wait several days for the road to become free again. They look for an alternative route around the blocked area. Do you see how much water there is? We could sink here. I can't imagine how we would get around that bit with the two trees over there. No idea. To the right? To the right. Centimetre by centimetre, Yegor advances on the thin ice. Kolya secures the car on the side. Oh, fuck. At that moment, an oncoming vehicle blocks their way. What now? Why do you drive along here without checking the area first? The way in front is blocked, and they can't go back either. There are very few options left to avoid having to leave the car behind until next year. 
The men want to try using a cable winch and ease the car down the slope sideways. We've managed the tricky icy bit. I'm happy. I don't want to sleep anymore. I'm not hungry or thirsty anymore. But at last, we can keep going. For the near future, a modern railway is planned between Salihat and Nadim along the old Stalin railway. Will there ever be a paved road that makes traveling between the two towns easier? No one knows. Yuri and his colleagues have made it. The convoy reaches the control station. From there, it's just a few more kilometers into town. You're from here, right? You have one car? Three. Good luck. Uh -huh. Yuri can't imagine a life without that road and the snow. This road is like a treat for me. The winter road will always remain the winter road. If you work here with good people, you won't ever feel fatigued. Of course you'll get tired, but you're always in a good mood. It's fun. You do a job which you sometimes doubted you can succeed at. You wonder how you've achieved this much, but it's a fact. We've made it without much ado. Winter in Canada's far north is the most important travel season for the people who live there. Ice roads are built across hundreds of miles, connecting frozen rivers and lakes, reaching remote villages and stretching up to the very northern tip of the country by the Arctic Ocean. They are highways across the icy tundra, all the way out to the Mackenzie River Delta. These are roads to solitude, Roads that disappear from the map completely as soon as the ice melts in spring. Early morning in Inuvik, a small town in the Arctic Northwest Territories of Canada. Kurt Weinman and his crew are starting work for the day, making sure the ice roads are drivable. The ice road's been a, well, it's been a lifelong thing for the company here uh, since day one. Um, you know, it's a maintenance contract, it's money to us, it's a, it's a job, it's a lifestyle, it's different. Not everywhere in the world people build ice roads to get to community to community, right? Everything around here is winter-based work to do any exploration, to do any, anything going forward. Access to the oil fields out in the Ellis Island, out in the ocean area, right? It's, a, it's been a meaningful, uh, me and the ice road have had meaningful relationship most of my life. <laughs> We started off with one, one, one plow truck and one semi. Ended up to, I uh, got about 350 pieces of equipment now. We started around December 1st, we started checking ice. By December 10th, we started plowing the roads. Thanks to the continental climate, there isn't much snowfall in the westernmost part of Canada's Arctic province. And the little snow that does fall is powdery dry. In the beginning we just clean it off and then the ice thickens and then we go and we do greater work. We ice blade it so it gets smoother. Ice isn't totally smooth, eh? like everyone see, thinks it is. It's actually rough. It's pretty hard on the vehicle. So when we grade it smooth, it, it flattens it down like an asphalt road. Right? So.
To do that, they attach massive steel planers to the front and sides of the snow plows. Kurt and his crew often need to drive back and forth several times to make absolutely sure the roads are wide enough. It's got to be 100 feet wide to accommodate the weight. You can go narrower, but it doesn't work. It's got to be at 100 feet wide to, to hold the flotation. If this was your ice road and this was your sides, it floats up, right? And the sides break off, eh? Because this is like a ship, it floats, right? And the sides break off and they fall down and they don't gain any insight. Or they lean like this and there's always water in the cracks, right? You want to haul uh, heavy transport loads, it's most likely mid-February to the end of February until the ice builds naturally on its own thick enough, right? And we do uh, profiling with GPRs. We profile the ice to see the thicknesses. For safety reasons, profiles are mapped along the entire length of the roads. The first step is to calibrate the GPR by drilling a hole in the ground. Then a dynamometer car drives along the road, measuring the thickness of the ice. The radar can show the top and bottom of the ice cap to within centimeters. Hundreds of miles of these ice highways are built every year. They're a modern substitute for the traditional dog sled trails. We use it for everything. We play on the ice road, we sled on the ice road, we, we, boat, we boat in the summer when there's no ice road. Uh, <laughs> Inuvik is located at the edge of the sprawling Mackenzie River Delta, the northernmost point of the regular road system in Canada. In the local language of the Inuit, Inuvik translates to the People's Square. About 3,500 Inuit, members of the Gwich'in First Nation, and Caucasian Canadians live in harmony up here. It's a true cultural melting pot. Everyone here has managed to adjust to life in these extreme winter conditions. And for Pastor John Hansen, the freezing cold even has some advantages. The roads between our communities are, are very important to me as a, as a priest, as a clergy person who has to travel uh, between uh, four different communities here in the north. I prefer it in the wintertime because it's less dusty and not so much mud to cover my truck. Once the ice road opens up, I see all kinds of people from up there coming down. I'm able to get up there more frequently. It was Father Adam's idea to build a church that uh, represented the culture of the local people here. And uh, so he decided upon the igloo shape. All of the materials were shipped up or down the, the Mackenzie River to the site. All of the trusses which hold up the, the large dome that you see uh, were built by hand out of sticks of lumber. These days, it's no longer just Inuit who come to the church. A number of Filipino settlers also attend. Dan Helbrun is originally from Ontario. His spare time consists of just two things, huskies and dog sleds the most important means of transportation before people began using the ice roads. Uh, wait a second. Oh, this is Cash. He's one of our best lead dogs. He's a, he's a really happy, fast, strong guy. Creaky, come. This is Creek. Peek's also a really nice leader, and she's she's a big, big girl. Yeah. These are Alaskan Huskies too. It's just a mix of different type of Huskies. Spotty, jump up. Spotty has a lot more hound dog. We do sprint racing here, which is, see how fast the dogs can go, as opposed to the long distance racing, where they have to camp, and they go much slower with the dogs. Before, uh, short sprint race, which is about 16 kilometers. They will only drink plain soup, plain beef soup for about 24 hours before the race. They don't eat anything uh, solid because we want their uh, stomachs and intestines to be free from all sorts of obstruction. 
In the last 10 years or so, there's been four or five different dog teams that have, uh, that have quit because it's very expensive and it takes, uh, takes everyday dedication to give the dogs breakfast and run them three, four times a week. It costs thousands of dollars a year just for a dozen dogs and thousands of dollars. But I love the dogs. They're always in a good mood and they're always lots of fun. And we go out there, we play with them every day. And it's the, it keeps me healthy all winter. And it keeps me sleeping really well in the dark winter. Yeah, it's a very healthy, uh, it's a very healthy for the mind and body. Living with dogs may be the healthier alternative, but the trend these days for transport and winter sports is snowmobiles. Young people like James and Sean love them, working tirelessly on their racing machines at night. In late winter, toward the end of March, they compete in snowmobile races between the villages of the Delta. When it comes to this time of year, everyone think about competition. Eh? Everybody is allowed to Whoever. just pay your entry fee and then you have a chance to yeah. quadruple it or whatever. It's, yeah, it's a pretty good time of year. Yeah. Everybody looks forward to this time of year every year. Yeah. Yeah. You got to save lots of money for this time of year. It's hard on the pocket though, and you try to be a racer and all that. You gotta buy brake pads, belts, gas, oil, ski rods. You can't be scared when you race. Like, yeah. you'll be driving 10 kilometers an hour if you're no, scared. No, when you when you when you come to a corner, the first corner is always gonna be nervous, but the second one, you can't give up. Cause then you have friends out there racing. Your friends before the race, then when it comes to racing, it's enemies. People come to Inuvik from all across the province to participate in or watch the races that are part of the Jamboree Festival at the end of March. You come down the stretch and you shoot across over the ice road and onto the other side and get windy a little bit. The first place is four grand, I believe. Last minute preparations, and they're off. The course runs parallel to the ice road right outside of town. That way, there is enough space for the mechanics and their repair vehicles. The audience has a front row seat all along the course. Depending on the race, drivers have to race around the course 25 to 40 times. Tactics are key here, but physical strength helps on the jumps and bumps as well. James has to end the race early. He's dislocated his shoulder and needs to go to the hospital. Dropping out is part of the race though, and the show must go on. After a long, dark winter, everyone in Inuvik is longing for a change. The Jamboree Festival, which takes place in March, is right on time. After all, it's only minus 15 Celsius now. Along the ice road, people are barbecuing burgers, meeting friends, and following the various competitions. Traditional dishes are also popular, including caribou soup or sweet pastries deep fried in hot oil. People here call them Eskimo donuts. Another important part of the Jamboree is, of course, dog sled racing. Dan and his girlfriend have brought one sled each. They were expecting three more teams from Alaska, but they got stuck in a blizzard. Not unusual up here. 
The race is taking place anyway, so Dan puts small leather shoes on his dog's feet to protect them from the sharp edges of the icy snow. One minute to start. One minute. One minute. One minute to start. That's the way they go, folks. They'll be back here in about 45 minutes. The race course parallels the ice highway for five miles, turning the entire stretch into a mobile grandstand. Keeping sled dogs isn't all that common these days, but everybody loves watching the dogs race, even if it's just two teams this time. Dan's girlfriend is winning the race, which means the prize money of $1,000 will stay in the family. Canada's winter roads start down south, where a paved road leads from Whitehorse up to Dawson City. From there to Inuvik, the so-called Dempster Highway is just a gravel road covered by snow and ice through 450 miles of uninhabited wilderness. During winter, the road north turns into a magical journey through a wondrous world of ice. In the old days, People only traveled long distances using dog sleds in winter. In summer, the tundra was just a swampland without any roads. In the 1950s, people tried for the first time to bore their way into the wilderness using machines. So-called cat trains, a long line of bulldozers and sleds, made their way across frozen ground at a snail's pace. They brought supplies to remote locations and delivered heavy equipment used in the extraction of natural resources. In the mid-1950s, people then built the first road to Dawson City, a former gold mining town on the Klondike. The little town has kept much of its flair from the pioneer days, but there is still no bridge across the Yukon in summer, just a ferry boat going back and forth. In winter, there is an ice road for five months. North of Dawson City, the landscape gets even lonelier and less inhabited. This is where the huge caribou herds roam. The so-called porcupine herd alone consists of 120 to 170,000 animals. Every year they migrate over 1,300 miles between Alaska and the Yukon province. It's an arctic spectacle of nature that's been going on for thousands of years. Eagle Plains is the only service station on the Dempster Highway. It has a gas station, a container motel, and a road maintenance depot. This morning, so Kathy, the supervisor, is assigning tasks during the daily briefing. Then he can clean it up before you guys get there. Traffic, narrow areas, wind, controls, radio communication. Do you still have your inReach from yesterday? Is it charged? Kathy and her guys have to make sure the roads are passable all winter long, and they are responsible for 130 miles of highway up to the border of the Northwest Territories. They have to go out when it's dark, when it's minus 45 Celsius, when blizzards are sweeping across the mountains, 
and later on when the road is turned into a muddy track by spring temperatures. Eagle Plains is the only outpost of civilization in the area. The next town, Dawson City, is about 250 miles away and the journey there is fraught with danger. We are on a road check right now and what I'm looking for normally is any broken down vehicles. There could be people that have been stranded overnight. Uh, sometimes people aren't prepared for this road. They don't have the proper footwear. They're, they don't carry a shovel with them. They don't have chains. The blowing snow can make a big difference in driving. Uh, snow poles that are 100 feet apart and when we can't see more than two snow poles, we shut the road down. Can you make another pass towards the circle here, Dwayne? It's not so much the amount of snow the plows have to deal with, but the drifts. Wind can compress the actually powdery snow so tightly that it's as hard as concrete. Yukon is the center of the cold pole in North America, where temperatures have gone as low as minus 63 Celsius and winds of 75 miles per hour are not unusual during storms near the Arctic Circle. Trees in the Richardson Mountains can't survive this kind of climate, and for truckers, this glistening emptiness makes it difficult to navigate. The mountains turn into Sahara-like dunes of snow, and the vast landscape is reduced to just a few lines. The Dempster Highway was built just 40 years ago. It was the first road in Canada to cross the Arctic Circle and is still the only one now. It covers the same distance as Paris to Marseille, but without any traffic lights, intersections, or people. On the northern flank of the mountains, the highway leads into the vast delta of the Mackenzie River. It's a maze of tributaries and lakes known to very few people before the highway was built. Bush pilot Fred Carmichael was one of them. Flying was only a really means of traveling between communities, other than if you went by a skidoo or, or a dog team. Or Basically, I left the trap line where I was driving dog team to, to, for, as transportation, as the means of getting to the trap line and hunting and everything. From there, I went directly to an airplane. Fred is 81 years old now and one of the last people still able to master the dangerous art of flying with snow blades. I guess 61 years now that I've been flying. It's totally different today than, than the way the, you know, the, the, in the old days, I mean, uh, all the lakes you saw out there, there would be, you know, see signs of people, tracks and trails all over them because they were trapping muskrat. It was nothing for uh, a family to get anywhere from five to 10,000 muskrat in a season. But these days, muskrat fur is out of fashion, and bush pilots are fewer and far between. Small roads off the main ice highway take you deeper into the Mackenzie River Delta to the tribal area of the Gwich'in First Nation. 
Only during winter is the ice thick enough for trucks and emergency vehicles to reach these remote settlements. The ice road also helps hunters and trappers reach their hunting grounds more easily. And the delta is teeming with game, including musk ox, caribou, moose, fox, and beaver. The Gwich'in have been living in the heart of the delta for thousands of years, but elements of modern civilization have arrived even in small villages like Aklavik where people ride snowmobiles and get electricity from generators. Nevertheless, some of the older inhabitants, like Billy Archie, try to maintain a traditional lifestyle as hunters and trappers. Not just because it's been part of their culture for centuries, but for financial reasons as well. Uh, muskox, you got about 150 pounds of meat for one, so you try and buy that from the stores, you, you gotta be wealthy. Uh, they make good, they, they make good burgers. So <laughs> at, the, at the end, I mean, that's, that's the way it is. We gotta keep our deep freezers full and never know, there's times when uh, the caribou or animals don't come near and uh, it, it has happened. My generation growing up, uh, back when the prices of foxes were like $300, now you'd be lucky to get 20 bucks. Our people were so independent at one time, uh, living off of the land, and it is a challenge for, uh, for communities adapting. Boom and bust with oil and gas. Uh, our community back in the day was, uh, around a thousand people, now we're down to 600. So young folks getting their education, moving on and getting a career in Inuvik or Yellowknife or Whitehorse. And... Back to the ice road and the Jamboree, where people are waiting excitedly on this particular Sunday night. Many of them have come all the way from town to the Delta for the special event in which the reindeer are brought out to their summer pasture. To provide a reliable source of food for the people up north, the Canadian government imported a herd of reindeer from Sweden in the 1930s, including their shepherds from Lapland. Unlike wild caribou, which go on long migrations, reindeer usually stay in one place. This of course helped the Inuit and Gwich'in to find sustenance even in lean times. Today, Lloyd Binder takes care of the herd. He is a descendant of those Swedish shepherds. They stay on this side of the river uh, until just about today. And today is the, th the second, is it the second? The third of April. And we usually figure that the first fawns start to come about the seventh of April. So the thing is that we like to have the herd cross the ice road so that, it, that uh, afterwards there's no stress. The animals don't have to go anywhere. They just naturally graze on this island. It's called Richard's Island. It usually isn't too much of a challenge, but sometimes, like they say, shit will happen. And we had this very uh, bad circumstance. One November we came and there, was, there were no animals left on, on the island. So we had to go looking for them on the mainland side. And they had gone across the river and then further north. We spent, uh, Basically, we spent three months collecting what we could, and we lost about uh, 1,500 reindeer. This year, everything goes well, and all of the reindeer are brought safely across the road. During summer, those 3,000 animals will fan out over the pasture lands. Over the next couple of weeks, Lloyd is expecting 1,500 fawns, just in time for the region to slowly leave winter behind.
The next morning, we get an idea of just how hard the winter can be here, even in April. It's minus 25 degrees Celsius in Inuvik. It's windy, cloudy, and there are snow flurries. But during the long winter months, it's even darker, colder, and more depressing up here. Now spring is almost here, and the little bit of cold left in the air certainly isn't keeping anybody from the jamboree. Traditional gloves of polar bear fur and boots out of seal skin or moose hide are good protection against the extreme temperatures. Let the games and the festivities begin. The most popular competitions focus on traditional skills like tea boiling, which is more exciting than it may sound. The men have to chop wood as fast as they can and light a fire to boil tea in a simple tin can without using any other tools. Tea boiling. Spectators all around. Parents, please watch your kids. It's a skill one had to master during trapper times. After falling into an icy river, for example, a fast cup of boiling tea could decide whether you survived or not. In the end, the oldest participant among the Gwichins gets his tea ready first and wins the competition. Afterwards, everyone has a sip. The smoky taste of the fire brings back memories of the old days, when trappers were still common in the region, where the grandparents still cooked over an open fire. The audience is even more excited about the next competition, muskrat skinning. It was an everyday skill for the older people in the crowd, who still witnessed the heyday of trapping in the Delta. But for the younger folks, it still takes a bit of getting used to. Get set. Go. The fluffy pelts of the muskrat were once the most important article of commerce in this region. And once again, it is an older participant who wins the competition, taking only 30 seconds to skin the whole animal. What you got there? How about you want to come and get your prize at the stage? At the kindergarten in Inuvik, even the little ones help prepare food for the jamboree. They chop vegetables and caribou meat using ulu knives, the traditional tool of the Inuit. Ulus are as sharp as razor blades but the kids seem to know exactly what they're doing. In the evening, a huge buffet is prepared at the local gym. The kids have made a caribou soup and almost everybody has brought homemade dishes for the event. There are also a few regional specialties from the Delta on display, including muskrat. <laughs> They trap the muskrats in the muskrat houses and then they skin them and then they cook them. Yeah, and they even have the tail there. We do have the tail, that's a delicacy. According to tradition here in the north, all of the nearly 500 guests have to be served food before the evening program can begin. After the meal, people sing old songs and perform traditional dances for hours on end. The drums set the rhythm. It's hypnotic and archaic. It's a celebration for all generations, and even the youngest are joining in.
This is how they welcome spring at the Jamboree, and its arrival at the beginning of April is heralded by wondrously long, bright evenings all across the watery maze of the Delta. It is almost the end of the season for the ice roads now, just a few more weeks before they melt away once again. Inuvik is the starting point for the northernmost and most spectacular section of Canada's winter roads. On the easternmost arm of the Mackenzie River, a road of pure ice leads across the delta up to the Arctic Ocean and further across the ice pack to the town of Taktoyaktuk. The harbor of Inuvik seems frozen in time. Indeed, six months of the year, the Mackenzie River is completely covered in ice. From mid-December to the end of April, the ice is safe enough to transport heavy goods all the way out into the Arctic Ocean. The road seems glassy over vast distances here, and people rarely use spike tires because the extreme temperatures keep the ice from getting slippery. We arrive at the tree line shortly before reaching the frozen Arctic Ocean. From there, an endless white expanse surrounds the road all the way to the horizon. After 115 miles on ice, Taktayaktuk finally appears in front of us. It's the northernmost town on the Canadian mainland, a centuries-old Inuit settlement. About a thousand people live here at the edge of the world, but they do enjoy some modern comforts. The extreme location of the village just requires some extra effort. There are no basements, and houses are built on stilts so they don't sink into the marshy tundra in summer. While Inubik has central water and gas, Tuck, as the locals call it, has to get fresh water delivered daily by truck. This is the only way to guarantee a living standard that includes a shower or a dishwasher. And the delivery has to be made quickly, otherwise the water will freeze immediately. Thanks to the ice road, supplies for the town are more or less guaranteed in winter. Trucks from the south roll in several times a week to fill the local supermarket's shelves. From boat paddles to yogurt, the residents of Tuck have a wide range of products to choose from, just like anywhere else. But living on the edge of the world is not easy, especially for children, as social worker Faye Trombley says. How long am I going to be here? That was about the first question kids ever asked me when I came here 10 or 11 years ago and they said how long are you going to stay and that's because usually teachers or nurses or RCMP or people from the south they're in and they're out like maybe six months maybe two years but they don't seem to stay very long so I said I'm here till my teeth fall out <laughs> and I happened to tell that to the bishop and he said keep brushing <laughs> kids like to drop in. I have centers of interest that they can enjoy. I've got Wi-Fi. The family might not be able to afford um, internet connection. Like there are many families in town don't even have a telephone. They might not even have a television, some families. So I try to say, what can I have available in my house that might help them not only to pass the time, but enjoy themselves and be a little bit helpful for them. There's no Catholic priest here, but we have church services on Sundays. 
The church is at the very far northern tip of Tuck, and in the winter, if it's 30 or 40 below, and you've got two or three kids to pack up and walk here, it's a big challenge. After all our Sunday services, we have brunch over here and sit around and talk, like we might talk for two or three hours. It's lovely. Tuk Tuk is a place of extremes. Human warmth and proximity sharply contrast with the fact that this is one of the coldest places on earth where people can still survive. While Inuvik is located south of the tree line, the population of Tuk is very exposed to the strong winds and snowstorms of the Arctic Ocean. In winter, the sun doesn't even make it beyond the horizon for 46 days. A minor mishap out here can quickly turn into a major problem. But as brutal as nature may be, it is just as beautiful and bizarre to behold. The icy landscape and the frozen ocean are mesmerizing in their melancholic solitude. It's a strange foreign world where nothing is as it appears. The 300-foot hills at the shoreline of Tuktoyaktuk are not actually mountains, but upwelling in the permafrost. They are called pingos, a sort of natural frost boil. To build a drivable road on the ice of the Arctic Ocean, you need to be a specialist like Mervyn Grubin. I'm 53 now. Um, I used to come out with my dad and uh, some of our guys with a bombardier track machine and and uh, just by traditional knowledge of where the ice is thin we'd come out and chisel some holes with a you know a chisel and scoop and uh, just like I say pick out where we know the ice is thin or traditionally bad and then come out and then plow it. Now you notice out here you see a lot of the cracks and stuff it's uh, a lot of the tidal ice is going up and down, but uh, you notice a lot of places too where there's uh, big dips on the ice. The ice here is about seven feet thick and crystal clear in some sections. Sometimes you can even see the sandy ground below it. We're totally exposed up here with no windbreak. You look at, uh, you go up further up the river, you're obviously you're in a river and you have trees and you have some, uh, a lot more protection. You get out, out here, you see forever, you can you know, keep on driving that way, you'll get, end up in Russia. Mervyn has worked on the ice highway for three decades, but now he is helping to build a new gravel road. This is the start of the Tuckanubik Highway. This is the first all-weather highway road that reached the Arctic Ocean in uh, public highway in continent of North America. And this is a significant road as it connects Canada. Canada is surrounded by three oceans, the, Ar the Arctic Ocean up here, the Pacific Ocean to the west, and the Atlantic Ocean to the east. So Canada is now connected by, by road to the three oceans. The new road across land will change people's lives in Tuktoyaktuk forever, connecting them to the outside world all year long. Perhaps they'll miss the ice road and some of the traditions that have come with it. Either way, it is the end of an era. Manitoba, Canada. Temperatures go down to below minus 50 Celsius, one of the most inhospitable regions of the Earth. As soon as the swamps and marshes are frozen, the ice road season begins. It's the only period of time in which the inhabitants of these isolated areas can be supplied with goods. 
It's a short period of time. Everything that people need for the course of the whole year must be brought there within two to three months. The problem is, no one knows for exactly how long the deep frozen swamps and lakes will be passable for the 40-ton trucks. Every single trip to the north is a risky ride. Go ahead a little bit. Hot roads, the Canadian ice roads. We're going to offer a little bit of tobacco to the uh, to the, the, the smudge here. We're going to put some of that tobacco in, in our pipe. We're offering this pipe as a way of our uh, acknowledging that you're going to you're going to have a safe trip. I want you to um, just. Uh, Scott Campbell's ancestors belonged to the First Nation, the country's native people. He is proud to be one of them. Pray out loud for those things that you, that you want on this journey, and then after that, you you and I will smoke that pipe. Boy, you got lots of hair anyway. <laughs> Ahead of Scott lies a dangerous trip for which he wants to prepare himself spiritually. I pray to my family, mom that they are kept safe when I'm on my long journey and to be able to come back home safe. Scott and Chief Calvin conjure up the mystic white buffalo woman, a powerful being and patron of the North American natives. Scott has promised a friend to transport an urgently needed snowmobile across the ice roads up north. With the snowmobile on the back of his truck, he sets off on a long, lonely trip. The white buffalo woman is supposed to accompany and watch over him. Spirituality is connected to traditions and customs and, and to family. Um, and I find that every religion or race has their own beliefs. Um, Native people tend to be very spiritual, very tied to the land. And to me, in my heart, if you don't know where you come from, it's sometimes hard to find direction in life and find out where you're going. His journey begins in the heart of Canada, not far from the border to the USA. Winnipeg, the capital of the province of Manitoba. From here, the route leads almost 1,300 kilometers further north to a little community called God's Lake. Last warnings on the way into wilderness. In wintertime, God's Lake, like many other villages, can only be supplied via the ice roads. The transportation of goods is a tough business. Most transports are organized by the state and are contracted out amongst the road haulers. It's a question of money and speed. Both man and material are extremely under stress. Every truck that manages to return safely is put to the acid test before being sent out back into the cold. Yu oh, Rowland earned his money already at the age of 15 as a construction worker, building the ice roads. After 30 years in the business, his colleagues call him Polar Bear. 
I mean, people used to get up there and the truck would break down. And if your truck broke down, in 15 minutes you didn't get it going, you were stranded there. I've had uh, guys freeze to death, freeze their feet, freeze their hands. Uh, and you can't go, you can't leave your truck because of the wild animals. You get by polar bears, wolves. So you have to stay with the truck and that's how people freeze to death. I mean, it's 60 below up there. That's, uh, it's not a nice place to be with no heat. Vlad Pescott arrived in Canada as a young man with $42 in his pocket. Today, he owns a freight forwarding business. As soon as the first snow falls, he sits on the driver's seat of his 40-ton truck again. This is my baby, you know. I sleep uh, truck, I eat truck, uh, I breathe truck. I mean, if something happens to my truck, uh, it's devastating. It get, can cost me my life. So everything's got to be tipped up. That's why I'm tr checking every single bolt, every single nut from bumper to bumper. Everything's got to be tipped up. If it's not, it can break down up there. Um, there is no way to pull over and, and fix something. It's minus 40, you know, you freeze to death in half an hour. Well, when I was a kid, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut or a president. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to be a pilot. But my father, he drove the truck his whole life. So I knew when I was young, that that's gonna be my future too. Uh, I was always interested in the truck and I, I got a diesel underneath my fingerprints when I was really young and I guess, you know, once you get a little bit of diesel in your blood, it's really hard to get rid of it. As soon as the road patrol releases the ice roads, the ice truckers are on the road. Every tour means cash. When I first started it, it was uh, real adventurous and it paid good. And of course, you know, I raised my whole family to drive in the ice roads and everything. So I just kept doing it. Now I'm just uh, passionate about it. I can't wait to do it every year. I can't wait for the ice to come in and I get up there and I get to drive them. And I wait for it every year. I love the ice roads. It gets in your blood and you just keep doing it. The loneliness of the Northern Hemisphere begins just a few kilometers outside the city of Winnipeg. Only very rarely do you meet people here. Jim Niedermeyer is one of them. He grew up here. In the summer, he works as a farmer and grows rice up here in Northern Canada. During the long winter months, he works as an artist. He used to manufacture mainly furniture. By now, he sees more in wood than simply building material. You have to see what you're gonna do in the wood. Uh, the wood has to have some kind of spirit in it that you have to see it. You don't know how it's gonna turn out. You start up the saw and you just see what happens. You'll see it pretty quick. You'll know that you could see something in there. You know, it just, there's an eagle and it's just, you know, the chainsaw is just removing wood. That's all it's doing, but this thing is underneath it. And it's a tool uh, just for removing that wood and exposing that carving. Along the ice road, people know Jim Niedemeyer. The truckers regard his sculptures as symbols of their home country. Well, we have a lot of wood out here, a lot of animals. To me, it's got to be part of Manitoba. You know, it's just uh, showing the creatures that are running out in the forest here. I, I try to bring them back to life in wood. That's my goal, is to bring them to life. The people living in the reservations are completely dependent upon state aid and upon the transportation of goods on the ice roads. Scott visits old friends and relatives on each of his tours to the north. How you guys been? He has met up with Lee Cod to go ice fishing. 
Lee is a Pine Creek Indian and, like Scott, fights for the remembrance of past injustices. What they did is, uh, when your kid was five years old, they would come here, take all the kids, all the children, and, it, and then they'll take them and take them to uh, residential schools, and then they'd, then then they'd either Catholic, Presbyterian, I don't know, uh, some kind of denomination, Christian, uh, and they turned them out to uh, be Christianized them and believe in something that they were that they weren't. You couldn't speak our language, and you weren't allowed to talk to your family members, your siblings. And there was a lot of crying. Lee is trying to make the First Nation members more aware of their traditional way of life. It starts with very practical things. We would never have gloves like this. We'd have like uh, 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 leather mitts, you know, that hides. Uh, caribou hide has a fiber, has a hole in it, that it for a good insulation that, he, that runs around this territory here. Lee wants to connect traditional ways of life with modern life. For example, an ice drill can actually be quite helpful if the ice is thicker than a meter. This balance between the past and modern age is not at all easy for many First Nation members. Ice fishing used to be an ordinary part of self-sufficient life for the people up north. Today, it's more or less a way to pass the time. Many First Nation members have drug and alcohol problems. Lee himself had a hard time too. Now he helps young people and is engaged in revitalizing the traditions of the ancestors. It has helped him to get over his own problems as well. No bites, I think all the fish are in school. Yeah. Meanwhile, you and Vlad are still heading up north. Well, I just passed you. I'm going up north, going to St. Therese. Uh, how's the road? Ah, uh, they're not too bad. Once you get up to about 220 there, before you hit Moron Hill, you're going to have to slap your chains on. It's pretty slick up there. So basically, same old, same old, eh? Same, same, yeah. It uh, looks pretty good out there. It's, it's never any warmer than minus 25. Like last year, we had eight weeks of minus 60 below. It never got, there wasn't one day that was below minus 40. So, I mean, you get up there, metal breaks at minus 40. Breaks right in half. And then you're screwed. You're, you're not getting out of there. So you make, make sure you got a sleeping bag that's good for minus 40. So, I mean, you always got, you got to be prepared. Fortunately, the storm weakens, so Scott can drive on. He wants to make up for lost time. That's when it happens. In a short moment of distraction, he starts to slide and gets stuck. But he's fortunate in his bad luck. Scott is already within radio distance of the next village. Help arrives after a few minutes. Scott's truck is badly stuck in the snow. The second vehicle can't get any grip on the icy track. Finally, the men try to alternately push and pull Scott's truck out of the deep snow. Done. And since everyone knows each other out here, a place to sleep is easy to find. Vlad and you have almost reached their destination for the day. 800 kilometers north of Winnipeg, they cross the Nelson River on the concrete dam of a hydroelectric power plant.
Worldwide, Canada is one of the major producers of hydropowered electricity. This is how the province of Manitoba produces more than 90% of its energy. The truckers drive across the last lake of the day in walking pace. Standing still would be potentially lethal because of dangerous cracks in the ice that might occur. Top speed, five kilometers an hour. There is air between the ice and the water surface. The weight of the passing truck presses the ice down a bit. It freezes underneath, so the cracks are patched. In spite of all the experience, every single crossing of the ice remains a risky business. Vlad and Yu arrive late at their place for the night along the ice road. They have everything they need for the night inside their trucks. Today, uh, how did we do today? Well, I think we did pretty fair. She's a pretty decent time getting up here to the ice roads. Hey, I'm good. I got my color book all done. So I'm uh, just sack her down for the night. What time are you getting up tomorrow morning? Uh, we may as well get up around 6 and hit her, eh? Yeah, that gives me my 13 hours. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> well, you need all the beauty sleep you can get. <laughs> yeah, you passed that. You passed on that a long time ago. There is no return for you. I said I'm too ugly to be on TV. Just show me the money. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, man. I'll see you in six. Hey, good night. <laughs> okay, good night, man. The second leg stretches from Norway House to God's Lake, almost 300 kilometers across snow, ice, and dangerously hilly terrain. The next day. In the summer, you'd find swamps and lakes, impenetrable moorlands. Neither boat nor truck could pass here. The roads across snow and ice can only be built in wintertime and if it's cold enough. One of the things they do if they find out the ice isn't thick enough is they'll send crews out here um, with big drills that they pull behind a vehicle and they'll drill a hole in the ice and as the auger spins through the ice and it gets into the water, it'll pull water up. It's called flooding the ice so they can actually add inches to the top of the ice to, to make it thick and safe enough. The ice must be at least 1.2 meters thick in order for the 18-wheeler to cross the ice safely. Vlad and you start their journey early too. If all goes well, they'll make the last 300 kilometers to God's Lake before darkness sets in. They are a well-rehearsed team and have gone through a lot together. If I go with you on the trip, you know, I feel much more confident. Hill is a great partner to be on these roads. You know, every single trip something happens. I know I can rely on that guy behind me because uh, he knows a lot. Well, me and Vlad, uh, we're business partners and good friends, like best friends. So we get along real good, and uh, when we travel together, there ain't nothing we can't pull off. I mean, uh, it, uh, we know we ain't gonna get stuck in the bush anywhere, and we know uh, we're gonna get anything done that needs to be done, so. 
me and him travel real well together. We uh, know each other pretty fair. It's the beginning of March. The roads are still in good shape considering the time of year. It may get warmer any day. Then the roads will turn into impassable swamps. Vlad and you are in a hurry. They want to drive as many truckloads as possible up north this season. Come on, boys. The ice roads have only existed for the last 50 years. There used to be no vehicles up here in the north. It was the time of the sledge dogs. For Duane Cabaluk, a construction engineer along the ice road, the dogs are just a hobby. His dogs are Alaskan Malamutes, famous for their strength and endurance. They can manage up to 100 kilometers without taking a rest. Up in the north, well, basically, uh, they moved around from place to place wherever the food was, and they brought their families and all their belongings with them, and that's what they used the dogs for. And your dogs back then were basically your home pets, treated, well, just like family. And in uh, summer months, when they were low on food, your dogs were basically let loose, and they fend on their own. That's why the dogs still have a bit of uh, prey instinct to them compared to most dogs. The dogs are not only persevering and tough, they are also capable of defending the freight and their owner against polar bears. Duane practices with his dogs almost every day along the ice roads. He hopes next year they will be ready for their first race. Vlad and you must stop. In spite of all the hurry, it's safety first. There is one kind of accident on the ice roads the truckers are especially afraid of, a jackknife. That's what it's called when the heavy trailer and the truck twist and wedge together. This must be prevented by all means. No. We got about 30 clicks of rough road in front of us. And we're gonna need some added traction because it's really hilly. And we load the trails like that. I don't wanna end up, I don't wanna end up in the ditch or upside down. So uh, putting up chains so I can basically make those hills up there. Well, if I don't have the chains, best, best case scenario is I just get stuck until somebody pulls me up. Worst case scenario, I start sliding backwards jackknife and basically ended up in a ditch. Truck, trailer, load, you know, uh, we're talking about $300,000 in damages, so I don't want to end up like that. That's why I'm putting all those chains. The ride through the hilly terrain is an act of balance. If you drive too slowly, you lose the momentum and risk sliding backwards. But if you go too fast, you end up in the ditch and block the road. One of Vlad and Yu's colleagues has landed in the ditch and must detach the truck now to clear the way. Without the weight of the trailer, the truck is hardly able to maneuver anymore. There's not much Vlad and Yu can do here, but help is on its way. 
Inch by inch, the fully loaded trucks work their way past the damaged truck. It's only later they learn that their colleague had to wait for two days before heavy machinery helped him out of his misery. Anything you learn on a highway, throw it out the window. I mean, uh, basically you can't hit your brakes on the ice. You've got hills up there and everything. You hit the brakes, your load is going by you. If you're going to hit the brakes, you got to use your trailer brakes. No, no tractor brakes at all, and uh, you got to have a big set of nuts. Vlad and you want to make up for lost time and speed up. But a lack of attention for just a single moment is enough to cause danger on these icy roads. Hey, you are, uh, how far are you? Uh, it looks like I went too fast and uh, I got into the ditch. Uh, I might need to pull. Oh, yeah, I see you now. Fair enough. A piece of ice was sufficient to derail Vlad's truck. And once a truck starts sliding, there's hardly any stopping it. Go ahead a little bit. OK, I'm going to lock everything I got. Doug just put her in gear and fucking yeah, step let, on the gas. Yeah, let's try slow if you can, then just start yeah. bumping it. Eh? Yeah. OK. A towing maneuver with 500 horsepower. They got off lightly though, just a slight damage to the bumper. Often enough, the two have experienced that they couldn't continue their journey. They had to hold out for days in their trucks until help arrived from Winnipeg. Many a driver has gone crazy in the loneliness of the north. Last year, a colleague had to be saved by a helicopter. It's truly a dangerous job, but 30,000 people in Manitoba depend on the transportation of goods on the ice roads. For the last part of the trip to God's Lake, the trucks need snow chains. Scott and his light pickup truck are almost there. The snowmobile in the back is still undamaged. The village God's Lake, with its 2,000 inhabitants, lies at the shore of the lake. In summertime, one of the best fishing grounds in Canada. Here, a highlight is awaiting the drivers after a long trip. Healy's Lodge. It's the only comfortable lodging in an area of many hundreds of kilometers. Not only the breakfast is legendary. The homely sitting room is a reminder of great hunting and fishing adventures. For decades, owner Goldie Healy has been making sure the travelers feel at home here. Good morning, Goldie. Oh, good morning, 
Oh, gosh. You got to see you, too. You made it. Yeah, yeah, yeah? it was a long trip, so it's almost oh. 26 hours, but we made it. Yeah, the road is better this year than most years because we haven't had any melt. Yep. Like, it's pretty cold. It's good, yeah. though, because the road's nice and tight. It's, uh, it was minus 51 this morning, so yeah, everything's yeah. frozen pretty good. So okay. made for some good going. Yes, but I'm going to let you have your coffee. At Goldie's, practical information as well as tales of the truckers' okay. greatest so deeds nice are exchanged. So yeah, I'll be right back. Okay. Before Scott delivers his freight to a place a few kilometers outside the village, he uses the opportunity to go out on the lake. His old friend Brian, who still goes fishing in the traditional way even in wintertime, has to bring his nets in and has asked Scott for help. If you're doing it the old way with uh, the picks and the chisel, you gotta dig a three foot wide hole, probably, you know, three, four feet of ice, and that's a lot of work but you do what you gotta do in the north, so. Basic supplies for the locals comes via the ice roads. But a diverse diet, especially one containing fresh vitamins, can only be achieved by hunting and fishing. Brian fishes mostly for his own needs. He sells the surplus fish in the village. Oh, it's a nice one. Only a few moments after they come out of the water, the fish are already deep frozen, ready to be taken home. An exceptionally yummy dish if fried in the pan. I used to do a lot of hunting and fishing with some of my family and that, and to be back out in the community of God's Lake now to, to help some of my friends now, it felt really good, you know, doing things the way they used to do things. and and knowing that whatever I put into my day with them was gonna help his family out. So it was good, it was worth it, I, I really enjoyed it. Vlad and you are still at work, but they too have almost arrived at God's Lake. A few kilometers from their destination, the last great crossing of the lake is waiting for them. A safety distance of 500 meters and walking pace are obligatory. Because when you come onto the ice, it deflects the ice and makes a wave under you. So all the time you're going across that ice, you're actually deflected, and you've got a big wave pushing in front of you. So now he's got a wave in front of him, and I got a wave in front of me. You don't want my wave to catch up to him, because the wave will hit his back tires, break the ice out, and he'll sink. So you gotta go slow, steady and slow, respect the ice at all times, go slow going on, Go slow coming off and keep your spacing between the trucks. If you're not only gonna like kill yourself, you're gonna kill somebody else if you don't uh, respect the ice. Even after 30 years, the men still hold a great respect for the ice. It's their life insurance on the ice roads. After two days of driving, Vlad and you do not want to lose more time. As soon as they are within radio range, they try to reach their contacts in God's Lake. Hey, you, uh, tell me one more time what's loaded first and what's loaded second. Okay, the health unit is at the back, and the admin is at the front. Uh, you're going to bed office, that's, that's the first load. They're going to unload you, and Ella from Health Authority is going to meet you at the bed office and drive you over to the complex. And I'll hold the second out. Okay, so is somebody going to marshal us from the corner up here? Yeah, Ally is taking care of it. Okay, come on. Unloading is manual labor. It takes time, especially if you arrive at the wrong time. Today, they are lucky. The helpers arrive quickly and they make good progress. 
While 40 tons of load are stored box after box, the driver's thoughts are already one step ahead. I mean, the whole season, you know, it's like roller coaster. It's like a, a long lasting marathon. You know, you load and you start thinking about the, the, the trip. Uh, when you get there, you start talking about uh, unloading. When you unload, you start thinking about how you're going to get back. And when you get back, you're thinking about the next load. Because that's the name of the game. You got to get all these loads up here before the ice melts. And you've seen it today. It got down to only minus six. That's too warm for these roads. If that happens for a whole week, we're finished already. The biggest thing I'm looking forward to is getting my paperwork signed and getting back for my next trip. Scott, too, has arrived at his destination. Hey, bud, it's me, Scott. I just made it in. Hey, I'm glad to hear you, buddy. How was the trip? Oh, it was good, it was good. It was a long trip, but uh, I got here, I got the sled on the back, everything's all fixed up. Right on, yeah, I was beginning to get a little worried, but I might have some trouble. No, it was a good trip. I'll, uh, I'll see you shortly. Right on, buddy, I'll be waiting. It was a long trip, but it was, I'm glad it's over. It's almost 30 hours on the road, and the roads are pretty decent. But uh, it's only half over now. I gotta unload this and turn around, and then I gotta head back. In delivering the snowmobile, Scott has completed his mission. Just like you and Vlad, he will now head back as soon as possible. Back across Canada's ice roads, for as long as the ice still carries. The Adriatic Highway. A 1,200 kilometer long road set against breathtaking scenery. The highway is one of the most fascinating roads in the Mediterranean. It attracts many visitors and beguiles them. A road of dreams that can turn into a nightmare. Jelko Krstičević has driven regularly on the Adriatic Highway since he was a boy. For him, this road is still a challenge and also an adventure at the same time. Jelko loves the highway, but also has huge respect for it. I've driven on this road countless times, but it always feels like the first time, because it's always so unpredictable. Sometimes straight, sometimes winding, and that's exactly what makes it so appealing. And as for the beauty of the landscape, it's indescribable. The Adriatic Highway is one of the most beautiful roads in the world. This technical masterpiece was built in the 1960s in the former Yugoslavia. The road begins just after Trieste and first travels through Slovenia. Over half of its 1,200 kilometer length is in Croatia. Around Neum, nine kilometers of Bosnia and Herzegovina are squeezed in between. South of Dubrovnik, another 125 kilometer stretch into Montenegro, 
the highway is still the major artery for Adriatic tourism in all four countries. Shelko's journey on the Adriatic highway begins in the north, in Srikvenica. He himself lives in the south, where he grows figs, mandarins and olives. He processes the fruits at his family-run business, making them into jam, marmalade, honey and liqueur in traditional old ways. He wants to try to sell his products at selected specialty shops in the tourist hubs along the highway. Hello, I'm Jelko. Hello, pleased to meet you. We spoke on the phone about my products. I'm a bit late. The road was very busy. It's all handmade. Figs and mandarins are processed mainly in the south. Jelko hopes he can attract interest for his specialty products in the north. From Srikvinitsa, the journey continues southwards. Just after Senj, Jelko will face the most winding part of the highway. For 70 kilometers, it winds in tight serpentine bends around the Velibit Mountains. Patience and care are required here. I think the engineers made a big mistake in planning these bends. Some of them are built so that their incline is, how can I say, just the wrong way around. However quickly or slowly you drive into a bend like that, it always pushes you out. Now we're driving into one of these exact bends, and it always pushes us out of the left. Now it's pushing me out. This part of the highway is also known for the Bora, which can sometimes blow with a strength of up to even 160 kilometers per hour. Particularly in autumn and winter, cars can be blown right off the road by the Bora's fierce gusts of wind. So this section gets closed off for vehicles in strong winds. Many car drivers would gladly do without these serpentine bends, but motorcyclists come from all over the world especially for them. Tight bends in a unique landscape, an El Dorado for every motorbike fan. For Jura Mishkulin, it's his home stretch, which he visits when he needs quiet and time to himself. As a bus driver, he also spends his time on the highway through his job. Yuri loves the adventure of this road. If only there weren't all the irresponsible drivers. I'm pleased that tourists like to come here. We depend on tourism, so as long as there are tourists, things are good for us. But they should be more careful. Many of them don't take enough care and drive at 50, 60 kilometers per hour, then see something pretty and stop without looking to see if anyone is behind them and turn around where they aren't allowed to, putting themselves and others in danger. Considering the beautiful scenery, and it's picture-perfect scenes. You can understand why people so often stop without thinking. And everyone who has ever driven on the highway quickly forgets anything unpleasant and raves only about its charm. Most tourists keep coming back, hungry for Adventure Street. It's hot, unbearably hot today, and I'm slowly getting tired. I feel totally sick thinking about how much more driving I have to do. 
Jelko, meanwhile, has left the winding road behind him and he's getting closer to the town of Shibanik on a straight part of the highway. Experienced highway drivers know all too well that stretches like this are not at all relaxing. Quite the opposite. The rare opportunities to overtake are used here all too often for risky maneuvers. An alert glance in the wing mirror can be life-saving. It's very difficult to drive here. It's quite demanding. It might be a straight stretch, but as soon as the white line is interrupted, drivers start tailgating behind me, impatiently awaiting any opportunity to overtake, and then they race off like crazy. It isn't normal how they drive. It's so reckless. The biggest problem on this road is this speeding, the risky overtaking maneuvers, and of course, the recklessness of some drivers. Here again. Two people died here as well. Something has happened at every one of these bends. Between 1995 and 2010, 30,000 people lost their lives on Croatian roads. Almost half of them on this highway alone. At least the police here are very much in evidence. They carry out regular speed checks and alcohol tests at certain sections where drivers like to step on the gas. As soon as police cars are visible, drivers immediately slow down and take more care. Most accidents happen because of using inappropriate speed. The problem with foreign tourists is also that they can't drive on our roads. They're just used to motorways where the bends are very gentle and manageable, so you can drive much faster. It's often minor traffic offences that can have tragic consequences. Making phone calls whilst driving and turning without looking have cost people their lives. I saw both arrows and thought it was allowed. The two most common causes of traffic accidents are disregarding the right of way and unlawful turning. This lady turned here from right to left across the solid line. That is not allowed that often leads to serious accidents. Local drivers are observed particularly closely. The police patrol has just found a repeat offender whose driving license they have already taken away twice due to drink driving. Police officers risk their own lives in car chases on the highway. Today, they don't have to race. The offender gives up quickly. Everything's fine. The driver's alcohol test shows no alcohol content in his breath, and the data check shows that he has had his driving license back for a week. Hello? Hey, 
Hello. Hello, Daddy Boy. Yes? Oh, no, not now. It's so hot and I can't right now. How far is it? Where are you exactly? Say where you are. There's a lot of traffic here. I'm on the bridge now. The Shibenik Bridge is not only a popular place for a photo opportunity, it also offers the very brave a special kind of kick. All right, I'll be there in 10, 15 minutes, OK? All right. Shelko has no time to stay. Dalibo, his son-in-law, has asked him to pick him up from the Kurka waterfalls and take him home. Dalibo took a trip with his friends, but has to leave early. Shelko didn't need to be convinced. It's rare that he gets the opportunity to make a detour across the nature park. The area is famous thanks to the cowboy movies that were filmed here. How was it in Srikvenica? Don't ask. Did you sell anything? Hardly anything. From the Kirka waterfalls back to Shibenik. The highway circles around the old Baroque town in tight bends. One of them is named after the owner of the house many cars have hurtled into. Here, Dalivo. This is the notorious Tsaritsha Bend, where trucks have crashed down into people's gardens and living rooms. It's been made a bit safer, but I still find it eerie. I always drive more slowly here so I don't fly out. There have been fewer accidents since a protective barrier was put in place around the bend, but Miroslav Militic still shivers every time he hears brakes squeal. My kitchen is down there, 10 metres away. This is where a truck flew off the bend several years ago and tumbled down here. There was a pile of gravel there at the time that the driver's cabin landed into, thank goodness. The end of the truck was around here, and the end wheels of the trailer were still up on the highway. Anita Kokolo has also witnessed quite a lot here. Bad accidents were a part of her everyday life as a child. There really have been a lot of accidents here. We heard the clatter, the screams. Then we heard the police coming, the paramedics. I saw the injured people lying in pools of blood. It was terrible. <laughs> K 
Continuing southwards, the highway runs through many small villages like a tightly stretched band. There's a lot of congestion in summer when the tourists arrive. I have to get back soon to get to an event. I'll never get there like this. Sitting in a traffic jam at 40 degrees is stressful and exhausting. It doesn't even get any better when you leave the highway and go into the towns. There are too many cars moving on streets that are far too narrow. And so Zhelko is also late for his next meeting. For this trip, he has only selected a few shops. First, he wants to test the chances for his business idea. Just before split, nothing is moving on the Adriatic Highway. It's hopelessly overcrowded. Streams of tourists come upon tense locals who want to get moving quickly, just like Maritza Bielobrik, who runs a small grocery shop in Kashta Lukšić near Split. She drives along the stretch several times a day with deliveries. Did you just see who came shooting out from a side street there? Side streets join onto the highway all over. That is a big problem. It's supposed to be a fast road, so there can't be a crossing every few meters. You have to be permanently on edge. You never know when someone will suddenly turn in from the side. The road tempts you to drive quickly in the places where it's well constructed. Car drivers can easily forget that there are houses, fields and schools along here and that side streets join the road. Many people have lost their lives here, including many children. So desperate parents were searching for a safe way for their children to cross the road. They found a solution for Andrea and his schoolmates underneath the road in a rainwater pipe. This road is very dangerous. In the past, when there wasn't this ladder to the pipe, someone always had to accompany us across the street. Our parents were always worried about us because children had been killed here on their way to school. Sometimes it takes half an hour until you can get across. Now, with the ladder, our parents are reassured. They know that we can cross safely and now they let us go everywhere alone. It isn't particularly pleasant in the pipe. There are snakes and rats, but it's still better than walking across the highway. There's nowhere to cross the street here. It's unbelievable. This road here isn't normal. So much traffic, such hustle and bustle. It's unbelievable. I don't want to live here. It must be one of the most dangerous places in Croatia. When I think about how many people have lost their lives here, hopefully it'll get better when the new section is finished. Maybe. It's not good here. 
In order to make the highway safer, there is constant construction work, even in high season. It's being improved in many places. Its tight bends are being straightened and the surface is being repaired. In some places, the road is built on such a slant into the hillside that in heavy rainfall, it gets filled up and washed away by mudslides. People are doing piece rate work in unbearable heat. When this road was built in the 1960s, it was an unimaginable feat of human muscle power. Today, the highway is still considered to be a great technical masterpiece. Engineer Zdravko Radusic was involved in its planning and supervision from the very beginning. The construction was an unbelievable technical challenge. It was only when we received machinery from the Americans that it progressed more quickly. Until then, we'd worked meter by meter over months and years, mostly using our bare hands alone. It was an incredible act of strength. It was all just rocks and woodland here before. Look where the rock was cut away here. Thousands of cubic meters of stone had to be carried away with bare hands. But with the machinery, everything ran much more quickly. People from all over Yugoslavia worked on the highway. Nobody asked if you were Bosnian, Croatian or Serbian. We all stuck together. Anyone would have given their life for someone else. A great friendship united us that unfortunately no longer exists these days. At the fruit stands in Ploče, the sellers still hope to do good business in the evening. The sweet fruit from the Neretva Delta is known throughout the whole of Croatia. Under abundant sunshine, the fruit ripens in fertile soil. Shelko is back home. Janja, his wife, is already waiting for him at her stall. Hello. How are you? Fine, how was it? Difficult. It was hot and busy. There was a huge traffic jam between Split and Markaskar. It's unbelievable how some people speed and overtake. Today's journey is almost over for Jelko and Dalibor. But the highway won't be quiet for a while yet. Even at night, the traffic continues to move ceaselessly. People are driving to the many clubs and bars along the road. And some sparkling nights end in a roadside ditch. The next morning, Jelko and Dalibar load up the estate car to continue the journey towards Dubrovnik. Here I am. Put it in there. Is everything ready? Yep. So I can go? Yes. Drive slowly, be careful and take care of yourself. All right. They drive crazily here. People speed and overtake. When my wife is at the stand, I'm always scared that someone could run her over. It has happened before that drivers have tried to get past other cars and have sped into the fruit stalls and flattened everything. You risk your life even just standing next to the road. Accidents on the straight parts of the road usually end up being the deadliest, as it's tempting to drive fast there. 
It's often young people who are killed. Often, it's down to alcohol stopping them seeing clearly after nights out at the club. It's the careless speeding and looking for an adrenaline kick that makes them put their own and others' lives on the line. Christina has been driving more carefully since her best friend Piero lost his life in an accident. She herself also had an accident a year ago that showed her just how quickly something like that can happen. It's been a warning for me. After Pedro died, I was scared, and so were our friends who drive. They say that they always think of Pedro when they step on the gas. Yes, it's only when someone gets killed that we really become aware of how much we're risking our lives by speeding. After the fertile fields of the Neretva Delta, the highway dips down towards the sea. From here, the road is open again for trucks. Branislav Jovanovic has been a truck driver for over 30 years. He transports goods between Italy and Montenegro. He spends a lot of time on the highway and still gets annoyed at the behavior of other drivers. When you're driving, you need to concentrate and mustn't get distracted. Many drivers stick to the rules, but unfortunately there are just as many who don't. For example, I can overtake here because from here I have a good view of the traffic, but others still overtake even though they can't see properly. Look here, if I hadn't put the indicator on now, he would have overtaken me, even with this oncoming traffic. Here you're allowed to drive 70, so why do people have to drive 80 or 90? Why? Since the Yugoslavia war, the highway has passed through four countries. Slovenia, Croatia, Montenegro and Bosnia and Herzegovina. From Neum, there's a seven kilometer long section that is part of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So two border crossings interrupt the Croatian coastline in close succession. Hello. Thank you, goodbye. It's annoying that I constantly have to show my papers when I leave my country here and travel seven kilometers back into it. It's absurd. Hopefully that won't be necessary anymore when the new bridge at Neum will join Croatia to Croatia. There are still 60 kilometers to go to Dubrovnik. 
Schelke was already spent the whole journey looking forward to fresh oysters from the Bay of Marliston, which are famous all over the country. Hello. Hello, yes, please. How's the traffic at the moment? Terrible and frightening. Do people always drive so fast here? Yes, terrible. Aren't you scared to be here? Of course. Two days ago, two people drove into each other. A girl from Neom. There was an accident here? Yes, by the rocks over there. People always speed here. Convoys start forming. Big convoys? So big that you get a headache from all the noise. We've put these white concrete bollards in place as protection, as a car raced into here three years ago. While some people fear the dangers of the highway, others see it as a challenge. Many tourists have the courage to cycle on the highway. They want to experience the magnificent landscape with all their senses. But the heat and intense traffic demand complete concentration. And the rest areas are the best places to enjoy the landscape anyway, even if you're on a bike. Zelko has reached Dubrovnik. The most beautiful town on the Adriatic is a tourist magnet. For George Bernard Shaw, it was even paradise on earth. Up on a cliff, with waves lapping on three sides, and surrounded by a mighty defensive wall, Dubrovnik continues to captivate all its visitors. Shelko has made contact with two shops and is hoping that its owners like his specialty products. He would also like to be strolling through the narrow alleyways, enjoying the grand beauty of medieval buildings, but he has to keep going. The highway is vital for the livelihood of people along the coast. Without it, we would be living under the kind of standards we did 30 years ago. This road has taken many lives, but it has also ensured the survival of many, giving them the opportunity to make a living from tourism. And the foreign guests who drove on the highway were always aware of how unpredictable and dangerous it is, and they came anyway. Just before Montenegro, an accident has happened. Some young Czech tourists wanted to get back to the hotel quickly after their trip to the beach and simply turned around in front of a bend, even though there was a solid line on the road. The oncoming motorcyclist saw them too late and couldn't avoid them. Miraculously, he managed to avoid injury, despite the severity of the collision. This was one of the many operations for the police on this day. They're pleased that nobody is injured, and are once more astounded to see the kind of rash driving manoeuvres that some drivers are capable of. Uh, 
Irresponsible drivers like these, who don't stick to the rules, do annoy me. Most accidents happen in the high season, in July and August. Sometimes entire families lose their lives. The highway leaves Croatia 45 kilometers south of Dubrovnik and continues through Montenegro. Since this section is part of the well-known smuggling routes, there are strict customs checks. As a result, there can be long delays. I'm driving through Montenegro for the first time now. For me, it's a real adventure. I don't know the road. I'm also quite tired. But I like it a lot here. This bay is so beautiful. I can hardly believe that right now I'm driving through one of the most beautiful bays in the Mediterranean, the Bay of Kotor. It's so beautiful. It's heavenly, a real gift of nature. Although the customs regulations make it difficult to export his goods to Montenegro, Shelko still wants to try. He knows that many rich Russian tourists go on holiday to Kotor and Budva. Two shops have already shown their interest. As in Croatia, the highway in Montenegro passes through beautiful landscapes. Here too, this is both a travel route and a town road, you need to be skilled at the wheel and have patience to drive here. The highway's close proximity to the sea that makes it so attractive is also its biggest problem. In some places, it's built so close to the beaches and the waterfront that beach life sometimes takes place on the road itself. The highway is like a woman, beautiful, unpredictable, seductive and somehow also irresistible. She seduces you into doing stupid things and then when you least expect it, she gets back at you. I advise everyone who drives on the highway to have patience, patience and even more patience. Although the new bypasses are supposed to help alleviate the strain on the highway, it is still overloaded. A trip along the highway is simply a must for any visit to the Adriatic. Despite all its dangers, it's a unique experience to drive on one of the most beautiful roads in the world.